Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dandelion Dynasty Book 4, Speaking Bones, Chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. No, wait, I lie. Chapters 7, 8, 9, 10. Painted Walls, The Sprung Trap, Secret, and Ice Blossoms. In these chapters, we have so many different things going on, but the biggest one that I am the most upset and worried about at the moment is what's happening with Thera, because it turns out I was right to be suspicious of that fucking guy. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Kyle for commissioning this episode. What's up, Kyle? Miss T is here in the chat. Uh, I thought the update helped. I am once again having computer issues, guys. And I thought the update helped too. And then it didn't. So who fucking knows anymore? But we're rolling now. So let's do it. So the beginnings of chapter seven, we are... In Taten Rio Alvovo, the eighth month in the ninth year after the departure of Princess Dara for Dara from Dara for Ukigonde. So we have got a rescue that I saw coming because I knew he was going to be okay. I didn't think Tanto was going to die. But I did not think it was going to be his own people who found him because he like dove into a pool and found his way to the bottom and I just could not see how they would ever figure out where he was. So this is, this was genuinely surprising the way that he comes out the other side of this. Uh, and it starts off with him being so hungry that he feels something in his mouth and he's like thinking it's probably his own tongue, but he doesn't care and he's going to eat it anyway. And he eats and then he hears somebody say, good, you need to keep drinking and eating. And when he opens his eyes, it's Razutana and he's thinking that he died and Razutana is also dead. Um, and apparently he has a fever. So, you know, I know that he's been in a bad way, but I wasn't aware that like there was more than just dehydration and maybe some mild poisoning from the mushrooms going on. But, you know, I'm saying that, but I'm realizing I'm assuming that the, the fever is the result of something like a flu. Can a poison cause a fever? I don't think I ever like thought about that before. There are just certain things that I assume are due to a virus. And I think it's because a fever is usually your body fighting back against something and it doesn't really like that's not the method it uses with poison as far as I can tell. Um, so it says after discovering that Tonto had disappeared from the camp, both Sataari and Rosatana were frantic. They searched everywhere, worried they, that he had fallen into a midden pit or been snatched away by some predator. And they had tried to ask his little brother who had a really weird excited and not that concerned vibe that pretty much told them this kid knew something was going to happen. This was planned. Something's up. And the only way that they can get his brother to tell them is by pretending to think that he was so cowardly that he just like ran away. And, you know, the kid is young enough that this completely works and uh, explains everything. There was much hand-wringing and debate over what to do. Razutana was determined to go into the barrows to find Tonto, a course of action Sataari objected to strenuously. Razutana tried to argue that the gods would not punish him for entering the forbidden grounds to rescue a child who sought to emulate the great Afir herself. Since when do you speak for the gods? Perhaps the gods do not agree with this parallel being drawn. That is yet more reason for me to go into the barrows. Perhaps the gods wish for me to intervene before Tonto somehow succeeds. And I love Satari being like, oh my god, you fucking Dara people know how to like 
talk your way into any position. And I was like, that's true. And Razutana says, yeah, you're right. And to be fair, any reason I give you like that is a rationalization because what it comes down to is I don't give a shit what the gods say. I want to go and get him because it's the right fucking thing to do. And I really respect that he came down on that eventually and basically respected Sataari enough to be like, I'm going to make these little arguments, but it's not how I really think. And I don't want to pretend that I think this way to like Loki trick you into agreeing to a thing. You know, there's just because he has got feelings for her, it would f be a little bit fucked up for him to sort of pretend to have faith in a way that just serves him with somebody who genuinely does have faith. It would just rub me the wrong way. So Sataari is just like, all right, fine. I'm coming with you. Um, after giving the rest of the children strict orders to remain in the camp and stay safe, Razutana and Sataari set out to find Tonto two days after his departure. They followed the trail left by the boy easily. And though the journey took many days, they steadily closed in. Um, only hours after Tonto dove into the water bubble, they found his pack at the base of the Great Barrow. And Tonto is like, did you get trapped down here, though? Because, like, I swam down, didn't mark my way out, and I was not able to find a way back up again. And Razutana says, at every turn, we shaped the glowing mushrooms on the walls into a sign. I've already gone back out once to bring in some supplies. And Tonto is like, fuck, that is such a basic fucking simple idea. I can't believe I hadn't thought of that when I was down here. And frankly, it hadn't really occurred to me either. I don't know if it's just because I wasn't picturing the mushrooms being like, you know, something that you could make a symbol of that way. But I guess it makes sense that like, if they're soft, you could just use your thumbnail and just mark an X to say that this is the direction I came from, you know? Um, and Razutana says that, uh, you've been incredibly brave, but don't you dare something, do something like this again. So they go out and meet Sataari. The walls of the chamber were covered by paintings in shades of red, yellow, and black. Some of the strokes had apparently been made with branches or fingers. Other parts of the painting had been made with droplets of paint spewed from mouths against hands or other stencils. Still, other parts had been done with soot and smoke, probably from torches similar to the one now lighting the scene. And um, this is the sort of thing that I always like. I, you know, cave paintings are a thing that you will see in textbooks, especially when you're younger and you're studying like ancient history. And I think it really fails to sink in what incredible like creativity it took to just make a pigment in the first place. And then a pigment that was going to withstand the test of time so that these marks actually survive until today. And it, I I just remember like seeing them in a book when I was a kid and being like, yeah, and so what? And now I have a much greater appreciation for how wild it is. And there is this really interesting thing that happens here. Um where the way that the torchlight hits at one point makes it look like all of the um, eyes of the animals in one of these murals is like, the, like the eyes are glowing. And it turns out that there's a type of paint that probably is conducive to growing the sort of glowing mushroom or mold or something. And it was used in the eyes. So that's what like grew in that spot. What I thought we were going to get there, and this is something that um, I thought was so cool, and I, I really should go and research more because I was fascinated by it. But there has recently been some developments with certain cave paintings that are, it's partial paintings and partially carvings um, that some folks have realized when you hold a torch in a certain way near the carvings, 
the way that the light plays off the actual like markings that are in the rock throws certain shadows that cause some of the figures to look like they're moving and walking. And so the theory is that these were like early attempts at movies and that we see them as like simple markings that are really basic. But when you apply a light source in a certain way, they are crazy advanced and like a lot more intricate and, and, a lot more detailed than it seems like they are initially because the shadows come together in a way that the markings separately don't look the same. It's sort of like holding your thumb and fingers together and it doesn't look like a bird really. But if you're in shadow, then you see it. And it's sort of like that where these markings separately, they're like, oh, this kind of looks like it might be a horse. And then the light a little bit to the left of it throws shadows and you're like, Oh, that's definitely a fucking horse. Like obviously. And if you move it, the horse's legs move. I just thought that was the neatest. And I really enjoy whenever we find out that like things that we thought were one way. And usually the one way is much more crude, I guess is the word I want that it turns out we're actually just dodo birds that didn't know how to use the thing. And it's way more advanced than that. Um, so anyway, uh, Tonto is looking around at all of these different things. And, um, he, uh, Razutana asks, were these the people of the fifth age? Because there's like a bunch of murals that seem to be telling the story that we had heard. Um, Tonto's eyes darted around the dark chamber and cold sweat broke out on his back. All the glowing points of light around the chamber were eyes staring at him and offering silent judgment. Um, Along the northern wall, the painted scene changed drastically. Here, large barrows dominated the background, many of them studded with strange structures. Tiny human figures appeared on the mounds, some tending to fires in front of cave-like dwellings, others standing at the top dancing or performing unknown rituals. In the foreground was a large lake or sea. Ships of strange design, like giant water-striding insects, plied the waves. If the human figures on them were to scale, then these ships were far larger than the coracles used by the tribe's people on the coast of Ukyu and Gonde. And I was just imagining here, like, you know, what you see when you picture of a a Viking ship is something that is all oars. Um, And they're looking at, like, this picture of plenty, and then things change. And we've got, like you know, the movement into now we're doing farming instead of just like hunting and gathering. And then we're getting into war and people like going up against one another under a sky that seems to be cloudless to indicate that like there hasn't been rain or plenty in a while. Um, Finally, they came to the southern wall. This time, the scene was of the heart of the city, where a giant barrow larger than any of the others loomed in the center. Atop the mound, a group of warriors stood around their chief, who had been drawn to appear larger than life. Her features were twisted in anguish, and she held her hands out supplicatingly to the viewer. At the foot of the barrow, a long line of people wound its way from the base of the earthen structure to somewhere outside the frame of the painting. They were passing large vessels from hand to hand, and those standing directly at the foot of the mound poured the contents out on the ground. Water? Blood? Kiofer? For the gods? And the barrows weren't built to house the dead, said Razutana. This was once a living city. The mounds were palaces, temples, hive houses. They domesticated animals and farmed here and fished in the freshwater sea. And Tanto asks Sataari, is that considered like the enslavement of the land? And it's really weird because as much as I would think that Sataari would be like really engaged in talking about this, she's super quiet throughout. And when they sort of like 
take her shoulder and shake her and go, are you, you okay? She just says, I've never been in a place so quiet. When I'm out there, the gods are always talking to me, even though I can't always understand their voices. But in here, I can't hear their voices at all. It's like the gods are staying away out of fear or respect, as though they're reluctant to guide us, as, that, as though we're truly on our own. And I don't really know what to make of that, you know? Um, I, I keep thinking about the gods of Dara and how they wouldn't go above the wall of storms, but this feels like her gods, not the gods of Dara. And why would they want to stay away from this place or not help her specifically or her people? Um, and they're looking at this like painting that's on a Garinifin stomach lining and they re it's like coated in a lacquer that keeps it from deteriorating. And it's a spirit portrait that's like ancient. And uh, this is a really, this moment is sort of, um, I can't tell how likely, I, I think I'm supposed to take it as a given that what they assume is what's happening here. But I'll get to it in a moment here. Um, Razutana still didn't understand Sotari's odd reaction. He would bet good money that the two larger than life figures in the last painting were the same individuals entombed in this chamber and memorialized in the spirit portraits. Based on what he remembered of Sotari's stories, they were thus likely the sinful chiefs of the arrogant fifth age. They were reprobates, villains, the very embodiment of the antithesis of the Aegon spirit. Yet instead of treating them with contempt and disdain, Sataari acted with great reverence and protectiveness. So Razutana and Tanto go over and they look at the, uh, the bodies and they have six fingers and six toes on each hand and foot, which is wild. Uh, and, and I immediately thought of what's his face who, you know, started this whole, like the dandelion war. And I was like, oh, is this, is he supposed to be one of these guys like directly related to this ancient people, which is certainly possible. Um, they ran towards Sataari, still motionless. By the glow of the torch, they counted the fingers on the interlaced hands. The great ki hero, Kikisavo, had six fingers on each hand, which gave him the strength of ten bears. The great hero, Afir, had six toes on each foot, which gave her the endurance of ten mouflon. And Sataari says the revelation... The Afir and Kikisavo had muddy feet and arms. The revelation was impossible, but the tools they had been buried with, the seeds found around the stone beer, and the paintings on the walls made the denial of the truth impossible. The heroic pair were not innocents who had been cast out of paradise unjustly, but responsible for the very works, or at least some of them, that had supposedly brought down the wrath of the gods. The people who had built these barrows and tended these fields were the ancestors of the Aegon and the Lyuku. They had made the same kinds of spirit portraits, worshipped the same gods, and told many of the same stories. The old stories are all true, Sataari whispered, but we didn't understand them. What do you think happened here? Sataari shook her head. The gods are still silent. One thing was clear. Afir and Kikisavo had tried their hardest to preserve their way of life. If they had enslaved the land by doing so, they never regretted it, even unto death. So, yeah, this, like, my assumption at first was, well, what if the old, like, these ancient people had six fingers and six, or, yeah, six fingers and six toes on hands and feet, just, like, as a uh, deformity that we grew out of with like, but then I, I was like that kind of evolution takes millions of years to happen. These people, as much as they are like an ancient predecessor, this is not that 
extent of time. Although we are dealing with a fantasy world, so who knows? But then I had to be like, all right, I, I think I'm supposed to just accept that this is definitely a fear in Kiki Sabo. Um, and Tonto, it's so great. They go back to the camp and all of the kids are absolutely like enamored with Tonto and what he has like the the fact that he had the fucking balls to do what he did in the first place the fact that he managed to like come back from it alive when nobody has ever managed to do that and no warrior of any age never mind a child you know um and Razutana had collected a bunch of like the seeds and things from the the tomb and he asks about planting them and Sataari helps him dig the ditches for it which um considering the feelings that they have toward farming it's kind of a big concession um if afir had so valued farming that she chose to be buried with agricultural implements instead of weapons then maybe there was something to the idea of digging for food out of the earth as the crops sprouted and then thrived Razutana turned his attention to devising techniques of harvest, storage, and ultimately cooking. He experimented with various recipes to extract the most taste and nourishment from these unfamiliar tubers and grains. Sataari and the children, to his surprise and pleasure, eagerly joined in the experiments. And I really do enjoy this, like, evolution of... I'm wondering, like, how much this is going to change things for the Aegon and Lyuku on a grand scale. Are they going to try and move into the Barrows again? Because I know at the moment that feels like kind of unthinkable, but they are uh, without any sort of like real shelter beyond their camp. Although I say that and they always are like, like that's how they live. So my instinct to go for a building is not their instinct. So I guess maybe they don't care about doing that. And it would still be seen as a sacred site, whether or not they figured out what's going on or not. Because they had seen it as a burial place and they're realizing it wasn't. So my thought was like, well, if it's not seen as something that sacred, then maybe it's still up for grabs. But I could see how that wouldn't be how they see it at all. Um, so then we go to chapter eight. And Thera is out with Gaal, who is, like, reacting in this way that she recognizes, and it's obviously an emergency. And she meets up with Tokval, who is like, yeah, I sent out a, uh, you know, that warning message with one of the Garinifins, and I don't know if any, uh, any of the people who are coming for us will have heard it as well, but I had to risk it because there was not an easier way to get a hold of you. But they are just beyond the ridge and we have got to get out of here. So she responds here, but Araten isn't back yet. And like, by this point, I was very much of the obviously Araten is behind this girly. Like, I felt like it took her way too long to figure out what was happening here. Um, and they are once again in this position where they are going to have to sacrifice people in order to get out of there in time her chest felt tight and she labored to get enough air into her lungs but he she knew he was right she had always been unwilling to make sacrifices but by now that obstinacy had been worn down by the pain of so many lives lost because of her she had to be more ruthless think of the grand, grander picture they took off before noon, abandoning the camp in the foot range that had been their home for the last few months. They didn't even get out of the valley before realizing that they were trapped. And they realized that the, the one party that Tokval spotted is one of several. And finally, Tokval is like, oh, we've been betrayed. And she says, well, why didn't they attack earlier? I don't understand what would take them so long if they knew where we were. And then she puts it together that his little stories to her about like the guesses they were making about when the wall of storms were going to open and, and finding out what she wanted him to do was as good as her telling him what her theories are. So 
basically they've been pumping her for information when she thought she was pumping them for information, which is the exact way to do it. Um, and this, this realization, it just like bums her out so bad. She's like, why would he do this? I should have been much less trusting, said Takval. I should have learned my lesson after Volu's treachery. And not only just like after Volu's treachery, because I mean, granted that man, I also felt like you shouldn't trust him, but I understand wanting to give him a chance. I sympathize. But like I said in the previous, I think the previous chapters, when those centuries disappeared and and Ariton showed up like later that same day and nobody seemed to put the pieces together that like that might be connected I found that really strange and that's not even mentioned here so I don't know if I'm like putting pieces together that actually don't go together but I thought it was pretty clear there were there was a bigger game being played there um so she prays to the gods of Ukugonde without even quite realizing that's who she's praying to, which I thought was a wild moment because I mean, who you go to in a moment of crisis, like that's a pretty big deal. And she doesn't do it consciously. She isn't like, I'm here in Ukugonde. Let me appeal to their gods because that's where I am. She goes to these gods automatically in her mind without even realizing it at first. She prayed for clarity and felt rather than heard the deep rumbling of distant thunder. The truth tumbled into her heart like drops of life-giving grain. And Thera says Tanto and Rukiri are all right. And everybody is like, what do you mean? And she says, if they had caught up with our kids, all they'd have to do was lean on us using them as leverage and they wouldn't need to go through all of this in order to grab us up. So the fact that they don't have any leverage means that our kids have gotten away. Um, and then we jump into Araten and his POV. This is really rough, guys. So Araten is aware that he's a fuck, but he's really trying to recontextualize everything about the fuckery into I'm doing this for the good of other people. And so it's not super selfish, even though he knows it is really. And it's like not even there are some people who genuinely deceive themselves into thinking they're a better person than they are. He, I don't think, is actually buying this bullshit. He is trying to buy this bullshit and he's only kind of, you know, like, uh. and, um, he is on the back of a Garinifin and there is this point here where he's realizing that they're going to have this, this is, I hate this so much. Um, Although Alkir and Gaal were heavily laden with people and goods, they seemed to speed through the air with unusual ease. Slowly, they pulled away from the pursuing Garinifins. Considering that Gaal was too old to even be considered a proper warm-out, the feat was astonishing and confused Araten. And Ar he starts to panic here, because the whole thing is that he has to prove that he is worth something to Kuju. And if he lets these guys get away, it's possible Kuju might think that he is in league with them the way that Toof and Radia were. So he's like, yeah, but fuck that. That's not what we're doing. And he says desperate measures. So what they do is pour some of that cactus acid onto the eyes of one of the Garinifins. And I hated this so much. Anything that's like animal cruelty, you guys, it is so hard for me, like, I know that cruelty to human beings is just as horrific, but because of the type of person I am, I take some comfort in the idea that a human being would understand why they're being hurt. And that isn't really going to change anything material about the situation, but there is something about knowing that they understand what's going on even if it's unfair and unjust and monstrous that 
I, that is like a, a line to, to cling to, but with animals, they don't understand what's happening. And that is the part that really like fucks my head up is knowing when people do this, that an animal doesn't understand why they don't have any concept of, of what brought this on, you know, and Garinafin are smart. So it's possible they've seen this done to others before and do get it. But like, it's really hard to say. And this is also part of the reason why I have always been so like creeped out at the idea of, um, a lot of like medical mal malpractice feels like the wrong word, basically medical torture, um, especially surrounding things like mental institutions, you know, in the misty fogs of our past when it was basically a fucking jail cell with people being chained to the wall is a similar thing where there are people with like diminished capacity who did not understand what was being done to them and didn't understand why they were here and why they were being treated this way. And that lack of understanding is the part that really gets to me. It's like the, that feeling of helplessness when you are in a bad situation anyway, there is something about knowing the reasons that can make you feel empowered to find a way out. Because if you know why it's happening, maybe there's an escape, but if you have no idea, then what are you meant to do to get away and, and stop this from happening to you again? Anyway, it just fucks me up guys. And it's been something I'm really struggling with, with training the puppies because I have such a hard time, like, training them to do things that I know they are not as happy about. They want to run around and be free and I have to train them to stop and sit and be calm and it's for their own good, but it's hard because sometimes they they don't understand why I'm like yelling at them because they're chasing the cat around and they're just having fun. It's truly something that I don't know how I would deal with it with children, you know, because I know that they'll grow to understand someday, but at the moment they don't weird situation. Anyway, this like horrible panic that, ca that is caused by this, it's like a mania. It often spurs Garinifin to do these like physical feats that are normally beyond them, although they definitely die after. And he knows that Kuju is going to be pissed that he did this to one of the Garinifin, but it's literally the best that he can think of right now. So they are per in hot pursuit and they are firing at these Garinifin and there's no real response from them. It's like, they don't feel it. And he's just like, I don't understand why they're not making noise. They're like moving when we strike them and convulsing, but there's no feeling of, uh, pain or, like actual audible response. And this is when he starts to be like, okay, something's wrong. Something here doesn't make any sense. And he's thinking about what he thought about Takval. And he's like, I assume Takval was going to try and stand up to me at that spot and that this would allow others to escape. But these Garinifin aren't even like attempting to defend themselves by dodging none of this goes together. So finally they get corralled and they're surrounded. After a few warning fire breaths, the refugee mounts were forced to land. As soon as his own Garinifin landed, Aratin scrambled down the webbing, dropping the rest of the way. And he runs over to one of them. Oh, this guy, his old mount turned to him and lowed in recognition. Aratin's heart leaped with joy. Perhaps Takval had been unable to put up much resistance because Gaal refused to obey him. He skidded to a stop next to the heaving masses of Gaal and Alkir, his mouth agape as he saw the riders on the back of the two Garinifins clearly for the first time. All the riders drooped lifelessly in the webbing. Not a single skull helmet was moving. Aratin recovered and scrambled up Alkir's webbing until he reached the pilot's saddle. He grabbed the man by the shoulder and turned him around. 
After a moment of stunned silence, Arrington cursed and laughed, though the noise betrayed no mirth, only a profound sadness and resignation. Instead of a muscled shoulder, his fingers were wrapped around a crooked branch clad in animal skin. Instead of Tokval's face, he was staring into the hollow sockets of a deer skull. None of the riders on the Garinifin were real. And he's like, oh, no wonder they looked so loaded down and they were like maneuvering like they weren't carrying any weight at all. And I love this. Gaal looks at him with this sort of like, yeah, you motherfucker. Like a pity but mockery as well. And Araton just basically cracks and starts laughing because he knows I am going to die. This is it. This is and a part of him is even like, wow, the gods really love to fuck with us, huh? Um and yeah, this I love this so much. The plot use the plot to use decoy riders to distract the Yuka pursuit was inspired by the hegemon who had once used a similar trick to capture Zudi back in Dara. They'd never believe we would voluntarily breach the realm of the gods, said Thera, just as they'd never expect us to abandon our Garinifins. When everything you've tried has failed, the only path left is to do something impossible. And, yeah, they set off to the east on foot. And shit is bleak. And it's about to get a little bit bleaker. I'm going to talk about Tom Banaki briefly here, her chapter is real short but i'm running low on time and i still have chapter 10 the ice blossom chapter to talk about so we'll go with chapter 9 being like kind of highlights here fucking kutan rovo is still absolutely out of control tom Banaki does not see any end in sight for dealing with this woman Everybody is absolutely in love with her and like completely willing to do whatever needs doing. Um, and she wants to like kill babies and make sure that the population stays under control. She wants to like get rid of, of agricultural land for pasturing, even though they are running out of fucking food. Um, abolish the system of native officials and reduce the status of all natives to livestock. And Tom Banaki would have to point out that these projects ran contrary to the goal of turning the natives into obedient fighters. And Tom Banaki says they'll obey only if they still believe submission will allow them to preserve what little they have left. If they should conclude they have nothing to lose, then we will lose everything. And she's thinking about how Timu is just like, basically unresponsive lately he is withdrawn and he's spending all of his time reading he doesn't really talk unless he's like arguing with her about something and i love at one point he, she, it says something about how he's like reading certain books that she managed to save for him not that he appreciated it and i'm like girl he is watching his people get slaughtered the least you could fucking do is get him a book or two like shut the fuck up um and he has essentially been like, just fucking kill Kutan Robo. And she's like, I can't. People will lose their minds. And he's like, well, and has kind of washed his hands of it. There's a real sense of just like, you get what you get, bitch. And I love this for him. He has been played so heavily that for him to just basically take himself out of the game, I'm into it. Good for you, dude. You know, like, ugh. Um, so then she meets with her weird little spy and it says, a, they say a purification pack composed of two Kulex and some native soldiers descended on Fada three days ago. And that place is the entrance to the underwater tunnel that led to Dasu now sealed up as the Liyuku preferred to travel between the two islands by ship or Garinifin. It was also where Tom Banaki kept her secret. Did we know about this underwater tunnel before? Because I don't recall this, but I, it, you know, these books are so dense and there are so many things that are made and then abandoned with battles and stuff that I, it, it may very well have been a thing that was a major focal point that I just forgot about. Um, and 
they built a bonfire to eliminate the contraband and celebrate the victory. And one of the Kuleks awakened to relieve himself. Stumbling in the darkness, he failed to return to his companions. And she apparently they wandered far away enough that they saw light coming out. And she says, okay, did you take care of it? The spy nodded. You got everyone in the pack? Another nod. Tom Vanaki sighed. She hated the idea of killing any Lyuku, but there was no choice. These days, so many things she did or condoned felt that way. What did you do with the bodies? I've come for your instructions. Dispose of them near another native village, one at some distance from Fada. And I'm like, oh, cool. So then the natives there are going to be accused of murdering these guys, and they are going to be, like, completely shredded. And it's going to be because you were covering a thing up. Uh, girl, really? Um, and then she says, kill everyone in Fada as well. And I was like, God damn. They can't be left alive if they've seen the purification pack. Besides, Ghost Tom will need a clear area to practice. And I'm like, should what now? Practice what now? And this feels very significant. Um, and yeah, once the bodies were discovered, the village would be blamed and there would be a new round of reprisals and killings. She hated herself. The tactic was so cowardly, so deceptive, unworthy of a true PQ of Lyuku. And she tries to tell herself, oh, I'm just using Kutan Robo. And I'm like, girl, you have lost control of the situation. That's what you have done. And I understand your feelings of like, I can't kill her when everybody is so into her right now. But you, what you do in this situation is you frame her for something and then execute her. Whatever it is that you frame her for, I don't care. But that's how somebody hand and I don't give a shit that that's like, quote, unjust. The things that she has done are worth being executed for anyway. You just need to reframe them so that it is versus people that your folks actually give a shit about. Because obviously she can just murder natives and drink their blood. And nobody cares. So do what you need to do to set this woman up. Duh. Like, this really is not that complicated. I feel like she's acting as if she has to be honorable in that situation. No, you do not. This woman is not your ally anymore. Like, do what needs doing and stop whining. So, chapter 10. The rebels are on foot and they are climbing a mountain and shit is rough. There is very little oxygen because they're super high up and people are having a hard time. They're, they're starting to hallucinate. And uh, Tokval is like, dude, I don't know if we're going to make it. People are at a point where they can barely stand up. And I love when Thera is wondering if she's failed again. And the shaman tells her, as long as we haven't been caught by Kuji, we're in a better place than we would have been. So it's fine. Um, and they begin to spy and descend from the spine of the Garinifin guarding the realm of the gods. They had a new goal to the north. And this whole thing basically boils down to they wind up teaming up with some native people who live in the icy cold regions. And these folks are very separate from the Liuku or Aegon. They don't have the same mythology. They don't use Garinifins because they're, it's too cold up there. It doesn't work. And they uh, have dogs that pull sleds for them. And that is how they travel, which um, <laughs> now the puppies that I have being half husky, I have, uh, been looking into training them to pull stuff as a means of like exercising them. So I have a like soft spot in my heart right now for this sort of animal and their languages, like they can understand each other, but it's definitely like a little bit different, you know, compared to the frozen Northern plains, the heart of the scrublands was a mild paradise, but things had changed with the rise of Tenryo. His policy of driving the defeated, defeated Aegon tribes into the periphery of Ukigonde had cascading repercussions. 
in the south. Some of the displaced Aegon tribes settled in oases in Lurogio Tanta, and in the north, the exiles came into conflict with the ice tribes. Unable to thrive in the unfamiliar landscape, the Aegon refugees became robbers, raiding and pillaging and looting. The small ice tribes, plagued by repeated incursions, gradually gathered under the command of esteemed war chiefs to fight back. They weren't numerous, but they had the knowledge of unforgiving patterns of their desolate homeland. They won against the Aegon invaders more than they lost. Some of the defeated Aegon fled back, preferring enslavement to starvation. Others, however, abandoned their tribal identities in defeat and joined the ice tribes, adopting their ways, which is the way to go. Like, honestly, get over yourself. Just, I, I am just, look, there is, I don't believe in any ideology enough to understand being so committed to it that you're like willing to die or enslave yourself rather than change the gods that you pray to or the stories you tell just makes no sense to me. Um, so Tokval goes to them and has to convince them to throw in with their group, even though it is going to be a kind of losing proposition, at least to begin with. And there is it, 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 this whole thing is just so tough to read because they do throw in, but the pursuit that they wind up under with Kuju is grueling and a lot of people wind up dead right off the bat, like before things even turn to a, a pitched battle, which we get to later. Um, so... Kitos, who is the the chief, he's like willing to hear them out at first, and he is not exactly thrilled, but he also doesn't like the Aegon, and he's like, I don't know. So Thara gives them all the jewelry that she has got, all of like the silk, anything that she has left of value. And even though she's like, I absolutely hate to part with this stuff because it's all I have left, it, what choice does she have? And that offer seems to be what convinces them. So then we go to Kuju. And he had executed that dude, that traitorous former Aegon Thane in a fit of rage. And he's like, oh, I'm going to, to get Takval and Thera and track them down and all of their children. I'm going to put them to the sword. And his people are kind of like look i look 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 i understand how much this has fucked your head up and i get that but like we need to focus on the wall of storms and what we needed from thera which was the date when it would open we've got already so maybe we shouldn't totally focus all of our resources on catching them and it seems like they are they have succeeded but then he hears about some people who have wound up teaming up with the uh, the ice people. And he's like, oh, wait a second. There's something going on up there. It's like Kito showing off the treasures that, that Thera gave him. He couldn't help himself. And it's really clear he had to have gotten them from somewhere. As soon as Tovo heard a description of the opulent Dara treasures, he realized the rebel rebels had slipped out right under his nose. It wasn't too late. Dog sleds might be fast, but Garinifins are faster. Now, at first, he's right. But because the Garinifins do so badly in the cold, they quickly reach a point where it isn't possible to keep going on the Garinifins. So what Kuju does um, is... He, wait, no, Tovo, sorry. Um, he makes the ice people that are like nearby give them their dogs, as many as they can. Uh, Tovo forced the ice fleas to supply the Liku with dog sleds and so began a long pursuit across the bleak frost bound north. And they basically just like, push these dogs until they drop dead and get new ones, which is just very short-sighted because they don't have to worry about 
like keeping the supply of that all they want is to get these guys and i'm like but how are you going to get back if you don't it's all all of it is very short-sighted um and yet even if they don't have a way to get back that doesn't matter to the people he's pursuing if he catches up with him then it's over for them so even if it is short-sighted in the the big picture it isn't really that helpful to point out that d- disadvantage you know um and Kitos is like yeah the fact that they don't have to plan for more than one journey means that they can just completely run their animals into the ground which we can't do and they will catch up with us so they start talking about fleeing over the sea and Kitos is like we don't do that that's just like tons of ice in that direction there's nothing to eat and there's mountains of ice and crevasses that like look solid and aren't and Takval is like yeah doesn't that seem like that's the thing to do and it takes a while to convince Kitos he is like really uninterested in what he thinks is a losing battle that does not involve him Talkfall at first tries to do the whole, like, I can't believe you would shame yourself by not standing up to these guys and be a coward. And to his credit, Kitos is like, dude, I'm too old to be shamed. Like, I I know what you're trying and it's not going to work. And then Kito says something about how, or no, sorry. Takval says to Kito something about how you could be part of something great. You could be part of something like a major change. And Kito says basically that he's too old to believe in that kind of thing, which I really understand. (laughs) I hate that, but I get why you would stop believing in that after seeing the shit he's probably seen, you know? Um, and there's, uh, Thera says that quote again in Dara, it is said there is often little to divide the madness of tyrants from the grace of Kings and heroes and villains alike demand sacrifices of others. The difference, if there is one lies in why the sacrifices are being sought to satisfy the ambition of the few or to secure the freedom of the many. So Kitos basically drops to what gives you the right to demand that we sacrifice ourselves for you and and what can you offer us for our lives and Takfa admits nothing you know I was like you know fair um I think you can still be inspired a true coward has no heart kindling for the spark of hope it was madness that made Tenryo think he could defeat my grandfather and madness that made your ancestors think it possible to kill a whale in a boat made of bones and skins. It's madness to fall in love and madness to have children, knowing the world is a cruel and harsh place and death our constant companion. It's madness to fight to be free when the chances of success are so slim. Anything worth doing is at least a little bit mad. And Kitos repeats that and is like, oh, is that deep or is that utter bullshit? Which I love that he says that because honestly, a lot of profound things teeter right on the edge of being absolute nonsense. It's like a completely fair question. You know what I mean? I really loved that he actually asks that. But finally, Kitos is like, all right, all right, all right, fucking fine. Let's do this. So what they want, oh, and you know what? There's a whole thing with Thorio, who is basically having a crisis of faith that she might have to kill people and she simply can't bring herself to do that. And Thera eventually just tells her, you don't have to. If you draw a line in the sand there, nobody is going to make you kill somebody. And I appreciated her like specifically, explicitly saying that she won't force her because it's like it would be understandable if she was like you've got to do what you have to do for all of us so suck it up you know um 
And then there's a very interesting line. Good isn't always accomplished through beneficent means and evil isn't always committed without some sympathetic cause, which is true. And Tothorio is like, okay, well then if that's true, what, how do you know what's right and wrong? Like, how do you tell? And Thera is like, you just can, which is for me what it always comes down to. You know what's right and what's wrong. You do. Even in moments of, of terrible conflict, because you are rationalizing why a thing isn't right or wrong, there's a part of you that knows when it's rationalization. And, you know, there's, there's times where I can understand giving into that when it's something that's slightly lower stakes. And then there are times where it's like, no, time to be honest with yourself about what your motivations are here, you know? And this is like something that has really come to the fore for me with um, the Hogwarts legacy dropping and a lot of people making excuses as to why it's fine that they play the game. And it's just to me, like, you are making these excuses because you know giving money to this property is wrong and hurting people. And you wouldn't feel the need to justify yourself if you didn't think this was wrong. And the fact that you're just arguing so passionately for why it's fine for me is evidence that you're aware, like, and granted, there are some exceptions where I'm like, Oh, you're kind of a bad person. And you genuinely don't get it. But there's a lot of people that are well-meaning that are st just, when it comes down to it, still pretty selfish and unwilling to sacrifice anything of consequence. And they will come up with any and every way to sidestep the actual issue and make it like, well, if I donate money and it's like, what if it's secondhand and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, dude, just don't. It's really like that simple. And that's why I'm like taking the Harry Potter feed off of public. Like there are just some things that my gut tells me. I can't be part of this anymore. And like, I know this is the right thing to do and it sucks, but it is what it is. And you do know, you do know, you know, I, I came to that decision and I slept well that night. I was like, good. Now I've got a plan because this aligns with my conscience. Um, so anyway, we've got the actual battle here and the, Ice folks have made this like wall that's pretty high by pouring boiling water over all of these like rocks and everything and creating this basically like giant slick ice slide that nobody can climb over. And I just love this so much. And Tovo is like, just break it and make footholds. And the bone weapons are just not strong enough to pierce the ice. And I was just like, whew, sucks to suck. Um, so they try to like boost each other up and they can't get one another over. They are in the middle of like creating these little pyramids and the ice people have these big, oh, you guys, they have this, uh, these pots full of some contents that have been boiling. And it turns out that it's a mixture of seawater and excrement that they have been boiling up. And it's like a combo of the heat being really damaging and the stench of it being horrific and probably like a chemical reaction that makes things even worse. Like, all of it is just so gross and it causes these warriors to become disabled, which they're not dead, but others who haven't been injured are like, I'm not doing that because if I get injured, I'm left behind. That's the way they treat people. The Liyuku abandons crippled people as useless drains on the tribe's resources, which like, if everybody knows that's how you're going to act, of course, they're not going to want to risk things for you. It's one thing to die in a blaze of glory in a battle. It's another thing to be like, have shit poured on you and slowly like starve or freeze to death when you're abandoned by your people. Come on. Um, so <laughs> they, uh, they, 
Thorio, in respect to the fact that she doesn't want to kill people, is helping to nurse folks back to health. Um, and Thorio even tries to go out and like tend to the Liyuku, but they call her a witch and don't want her anywhere near them. She has a hard time with that. And uh, Tovo is not used to this kind of warfare, so he's not really adapting super well. Trying all of these different things, which basically come to nothing. Um, and over the next few days, he launched multiple assaults, each more desperate than the last. Thinking the defenders would run out of stones for their slingshots and bone spears to hurl, Tova urged warriors to attack in waves, but the ice fort defenders were ready with ice balls for the slingshots and icicle spears, which could be produced overnight in large quantities. And I was like, that is a dope idea. That didn't even occur to me, but I love that. Um, then they try and like crack the wall and the defenders just drop blocks of ice on them and maim a bunch of them. They try lighting a fire and they just douse it with water. The Liyuku sought to intimidate the defenders by heaving bloody do dog carcasses over the walls. The defenders responded by lobbing back the heads of the deadly Yuku. And I was like, yo, you guys just got seen and raised. That is so embarrassing. Oh, we've got our dead dogs, which is like, that's just you playing yourself that you have all of your transportation is dead. Like, what do you think that's intimidating them for? And they're like, ah, uh, here's, here's your best friend. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, um, Tipo, uh, is let's see even your father would have to be impressed boasted tebow to baby crew crew i'd like to see him defend a city as well maybe he'll finally admit that submariners aren't the equal of aviators then she nuzzled the baby and added softly but when we see him and your siblings on the other side of the river on which nothing floats we'll be too happy to quarrel won't we that was sweet Tovo's relentless assaults failed to weaken the fortress. In fact, the ice wall was growing taller and thicker with every passing day as the defenders poured new pots of water over the side. The temperature continued to fall. One morning, as the first rays of the sun lit up the battle-worn landscape, the defenders woke to the sight they had been both hoping for and dreading for weeks. The sea had frozen overnight, and the broad plain of ice extended all the way to Spotted Heifer on the northern horizon, which I assume is a mountain range or something. So that is the end of the section. So this was a really fun, but it was like also brutal. I was so glad at how well the battle went for them, but there was just something about the ice tribes being involved and not really wanting to be part of this and having to like, they got a bunch of their people were slaughtered and their animals taken. And, and just, it's just so unfair what it comes down to anytime. It's just like, God damn it. People just want to live their lives, you know, but that's the way it is. So I'm really interested to see where we go next because the pursuit is going to have to continue over the ice and that's going to be a real hazard. So we'll see how that goes. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you again, Kyle, for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot until next time. Toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.